this week's podcast, we're joined by former Ulster, Ireland and Lions winger Trevor Ringland. Ringland discusses playing in an Irish team that defied the division of the Troubles to win three Five Nations titles, explains why Ireland have been so strong in the professional era, and gives us his ideas on how to make the game of rugby work better in the modern day. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. I'm Nick Powell, filling in for Ollie Little. Today, alongside our columnists Brendan Gallagher and Chris Hewitt, we're joined by former Ulster, Ireland and British and Irish Lions winger Trevor England. How are you today, Trevor? I'm good, Nick. I'm good. All's well. I'm now, as as Lee Trevino, the old American golfer, used to say, says, the older I get, the better I was. So it's <laughs> surprising anybody wants to talk to me about rugby anymore. Um, and I'm a grandfather. I've got two grandchildren. Um One's a soccer player and the other's a prop, and I don't know how that happens, but oh my same mother and father. Yeah. But uh, Where did that come from? And Manchester United supporters as well. Their father has indoctrinated oh. them, which is desperate because I send them Leeds United jerseys through the post and they're intercepted. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry. With the postal service, you're a bit unlucky there, aren't you? <laughs> was, yeah. Uh, we'll jump straight into what, uh, well, I mean, the busy and very interesting life you've had since since playing the game of rugby. Had a successful career as a solicitor, which obviously began during your playing days. Uh, stood as a parliamentary candidate in the uh, 2010 election. And most recently have been the UK special envoy to the United States on Northern Ireland. So what is occupying your time at the moment from a sort of career point of view? Well, I'm, I'm still working as a lawyer. Uh, as I said, I'm a grandfather and... And that takes up a wee bit of time as well. Sports-wise, uh, I'm on the committee of Queen's University uh, Rugby Club, uh, which I've been involved in for the past number of years. And I was president of the Irish University's Rugby Union for a couple of years, which was a lovely thing to be asked to do. And on the other side of things, I'm still involved with various cross-community projects and and actually trying to promote a more constructive type of politics in Northern Ireland. Um, and really, a lot of it is, does come down to to the shape that rugby put to my thinking over the years uh, because if there's one game has looked after all the children on this island and it, it has been it has been rugby over the years and and other sports as well but uh, rugby is just one really good example of how to do relationships properly on the island you know yeah I was going to ask about the um the 1980s when you were obviously playing it was a, a particularly tense point in the troubles um and yet on the field, the Irish national team had had tremendous success during that period. Three Five Nations titles in that decade. Um, what was it about playing playing as a as a collective um, that was that that people from the north and the south in that team were able to come together and and play together? Well, it, it, it's really that concept of of that that sport brings to things that, that um, you know it, it it enables you to to to. to compete even in the most physical of ways without actually destroying a relationship. It allows you to move around in in one day you could be competing. I tell a story about playing with David Irwin at university. We played in the same team together. They then played against each other at club level when we left university. And and one match in particular, uh, it was usually our most physical confrontations between the two of us. And one match in particular the referee called us together at half time and said, look, guys, cut it out. And the two of us looked at the referee and said, Dennis, stay out of this. Uh, but the following week, we could have found ourselves on an Ulster team playing together against the rest of the provinces in Ireland and then on an Irish team with those other provincial players uh, playing against the other the other nations and then on a British and Irish Lions team taking on the Southern Hemisphere. So it's that ability that sport has to move between those different identities and different relationships. And then in a team sport, you know, the successful teams, we had three very successful teams I played on at international level. And the key there was it was a team of friends, first and foremost. And we worked for each other. And then also it was a team of people who challenged themselves to be the best they could be and then challenged those around them to to match that as well. So um, and those are sort of the principles that, that certainly I, I look to and, and that you can also apply to a society. So rugby in those times, my father was a police officer. Some of the players were police officers. And the most dangerous place in the world to be a police officer in the early 1980s was Northern Ireland. Uh, and yet you had this other dynamic on the on the, the, the island that was actually building relationships right across 
the island. I've never had a bad experience through rugby. My father never had a bad experience through rugby. Um, we had guard officers protecting the likes of Jimmy McCoy, who was a police officer at that time, and and the army officers. They were prepared to put their lives on the line uh, for those guys, and and so it was it was a very different tricolour and a very different soldier song that was played at Lansdowne Road to the one that was wrapped around the IRA. Just as I would say that my union flag is a very different union flag to that wrapped around loyalists in 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 Northern Ireland, and and it. It was one great example of of things that kept relationships going on the island with others were destroying them. And and you had in the 1970s, the Willie John McBride and, and Mike Gibson and, and others who, who played away. And it was that example of community and people who wanted to have a relationship on the island and in Northern Ireland that actually uh, is the foundations on which we're, we're, we're hopefully building a new future in, in Northern Ireland and across this island. And I sort of worked to the motto of, um, in respect of, the constitutional position between the two parts of the island that rugby is a very good example of uh, happy to be separate but love getting together and you have thousands of thousands of uh, rugby fans go down every year to support the all Ireland rugby team but it's a sense of inclusion the sense of people wanting to be work with you and wanting to be t- together you know and it, it was mir- miraculous though wasn't it trevor i mean i think everybody get, fully gets that players from the north and the south get together and form a team, friendships, a bond. You go into battles together. That's not difficult to understand, but to get the whole island supporting that that one team, to get 20,000 people coming down from Ulster to watch a big match at Lansdowne Road and whatever, that is still still uh, a strange but wonderful chemistry to me. I'm never quite sure how it happened, but it was, a, it was almost like the Good Friday Agreement before the Good Friday Agreement, but it was just... It just happened, and I'm not quite sure how it happened. But it 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 it, it just it kept those relationships going. Um, even a hundred years ago, when Ireland was partitioning, the Irish rugby team was fourth in the Five Nations. And people say, you know, was there a different way to do relationships? And you just point at, at the likes of rugby and hockey and others, and it says, yes, there always was a different way to do relationships. And even in some of the discussions and some of the things I was involved in, I remember talking to to former. I, IRA men who had been prisoners in in the uh, uh, prisons here during the troubles, and I and I said to them, you know, you know what what were you trying to achieve? And they said they're trying to drive the British out of Ireland. And I said, well, that's me. And they said, well, don't mean you. And and I suggested, you know, buy me a pint of Guinness and we'll talk about it, but don't don't shoot me. And I do tell the story that I have a good authority that I, I united the people of Ireland at, at least twice. Uh, once when I scored a try against England uh, at Twickenham, and I have in good authority from guys that were there from both paramilitary wings of the Mayor's prison that when I scored that try, both wings cheered. <laughs> and, and then I united them again when I unfortunately let an English winger, Chris Odie, score three tries against me at Twickenham. And, he said, <laughs> and I personally didn't think I was to blame for all three, but my father said to me, well, son, he says you're on your own in that one. <laughs> and uh, I united the people again by saying, "Get rid of him; he's useless." So, uh, <laughs> but rugby was able to to do that. And you know, uh, as you look to the future, um, I was involved with Hugo McNeil, and he rang me when when the ceasefires broke down in Northern Ireland in, in 1996, and he said, "Trevor, what about we organise a match, saying the people of Ireland want peace?" And so, you know. He put it together. The IRFU, Sid Miller, Tom Kiernan uh, said the Irish rugby were prepared to 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 host the game, and and an Irish rugby team took on players from all around the world when they played against the Barbarians at Lansdowne Road. But it had to be more than just saying we all want peace because everybody wants peace. It had to also show that there are consequences to not having it. And and so on the pitch that day, we had a young guy who lost his mother and father and sister in the Shankle bomb and retaliation for the Shankle bomb. They, Loyalist shot up a bar in Grey Steel and killed this other young fellow's um, brother. And then another young fellow was from Warrington, uh, whose best friend had been killed in an IRA bomb in Warrington. And you stand there and you go, well, well, how could you make sure that doesn't happen again? And and you are there, you were there in, in an environment that was about an inclusive Ireland, and an, an Ireland that wanted to respect all the different traditions and wanted to find ways that they could work together uh, to, to take on other countries' effectively and and so 
it's not a casual thing. It's actually, it's actually sport actually has shown in so many different ways how to do relationship properly. And, and even the Northern Ireland football fans who, who were letting sectarianism destroy their, their game, and uh, they turned around and challenged themselves and said, we're pretty horrible and we need to change because we're destroying the game we, we love. With a bit of leadership from the likes of Michael Boyd and Jim Rainey, who were working with the, and the IFA, they came up with ideas, songs like "We're not Brazil, we're Northern Ireland," as if anybody would think otherwise, and <laughs> and totally changed the atmosphere there, guys. Like they and they they did it by looking in the mirror and saying, "We're pretty ugly, and we need to change." And and so sport has had a very positive role on the island, and uh, you know uh, the GAA. We work with them, a game of three halves, rugby, football and Gaelic, um, and the fourth half being community relations. And we have the kids here in the interfaces and they're playing They're playing together uh, over the peace walls and the parents are letting it happen, the community workers are letting it happen. And uh, so, you know, it, it's it's sports, it tries, to, it tries to help children succeed, doesn't it, really? You, you know, you get coaches coming in, they, they want a child to do well. They want a child to enjoy the sport they're involved in. And there's so many good examples. Boxing, another one, you know. So. Well, well, one, um, Trevor, one uh, slightly facetious question um, and one serious one. The facetious one is, um, from what you've just said, would you consider that uh, Warren Gatlin was brave or foolhardy to spray holy water on the boots of David Humphreys before matches? Um, <laughs> and and the serious and the other thing would work. <laughs> the, the serious question is, is it, is it, your sense now that rugby has a um, a, a growing foothold in the in the Catholic and Republican sort of swayed communities of um, of Northern Ireland, or is it pretty much the same as you were, or, or has it gone backwards? What's the situation there now? Do you think? No, I, I think I think Ulster rugby has has done a, a tremendous job in, in reaching out, and the schools have have wanted them to reach out as well, um, and so the you know. There are four provinces uh, as known in Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland is, is made up of of six of the provinces of, of or six of the counties of the province of Ulster, and there's another three counties, and they're part of Ulster rugby as well. And so it's always had that cross border element to it in in Ulster rugby, and and it's always had that ability to reach out right across the community. and And so as we we look at where we were say 25 years ago with the time of the agreement where we are now that increasingly people are more relaxed and and are prepared to to support the different sports and the sports are very open to to wanting to reach out to those people who maybe felt alienated for whatever reason uh from those particular sports and you know there's the work of the Northern Ireland football fans the GAA again um a chief the chief executive of Ulster Ulster GA once said, he says, when his county play, he says he wants all the people of that county to support them. And, and that simple gesture is is enough for an awful lot of people uh, to say, well, if you want me to support you, I'll support you. And and so it's it's leadership like that has been has been taking place and um, it's work in progress. Um, but Ulster rugby has been very much to the forefront of that because we we are. We represent all nine counties of the Ulster province, and we're we're very uh, that's very important to to who we are. How, how important symbolically was was um, was the moment when England played at Croke Park, Trevor? Oh, it was uh, it was it was just an, an amazing occasion, absolutely. Um, I went to it with Hugo McNeil, and I just I stopped the guard off. She said, "Where do you think there's going to be trouble?" And he told me where he thought there might be trouble. And so I went there to see if there was any trouble. And there was one guy standing there on his own uh, with about 50 placards and nobody else had turned up. And uh, and it was just a fantastic occasion. It it was the first time I sang all three anthems. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, soldier song, uh, God Save the Queen was played. And... and uh, and Ireland's, and, and Ireland's call, cool, yeah. and and it was England as well. And you know, in rugby terms, England a they backed us in the World Cup bid that we had. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And then there was the match when nobody else would travel to Dublin, and the English team turned up. And the and the famous words of the their captain afterwards, he says, 
we mightn't be very good, he says, but at least we turned up because they got well beaten. But that match at Croke Park, because it also had the symbolism of, of Croke Park, um, GAA in Ireland also playing its role uh, yeah. because pre- previously rugby was seen as a foreign game and Moss Keane, I think, was the first one to really break that mould in the 70s and played second row for Ireland. And and then they opened up the ground. Normally, they wouldn't have allowed any other sports t- uh, to play there. They'd opened up the ground because rugby was was um, redeveloping the old Lansdowne Road into the Aviva Stadium it is now. And they'd opened it up to the other sports of football and rugby. And and to have it there, the symbolism of, of Croke Park and the incidents that happened there in Croke Park's history as well. Um, and it just, as I said, I sang all three songs. And a friend of mine who was a... He's a former police officer. He he was stuck in the middle of a whole crowd of monster men. And he looked at them and he just, he was big. He's a big rugby player and he's quite brazen. And he looked around at them all, about 50 or 60 of them. And he said, right, guys, he says, what are we going to sing? He says, all three or none of them. And so they agreed to sing all three. Yeah. And they shared drink together. And, uh, you know, so to me, it was a very symbolic and it, it showed again that, that sport looks at problems and sees how to get around those problems. And it constantly looks to try and accommodate difference. And and that's really what it did that day. You know, it was, for me, a very special day. And Ireland's yeah. Call was, to me, a special, it's a special song as well. That You go back in the history of Ireland's Call, the first World Cup we played in in 1987. And we're standing there about to take on Wales in Wellington, wet and windy Wellington. and. Uh, we listened to the Welsh national anthem, and we wonder what are we going to get because <laughs> we didn't play any song when we travelled, and we got the about the worst recording you could ever get of the Rose of Tralee. <laughs> and I can assure you, there's many songs you're going to lay your life down for, but the Rose of Tralee is not one of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Con Houlihan, who was a reporter at that time with the Irish Independent. He wrote, he says, maybe for the next match you should play God Save the Rose of Trilly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how what Ireland's Call came out of. And the the RFU approached Phil Coulter and asked him, could he come up with a song? And so the four proud provinces of Ireland playing together, and it works for me. It's 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 uh We had a debut of that one um before the first match in '95, the, the World Cup match against New Zealand, and Noisy Murphy came into the press conference. Yeah, on the Wednesday with an old-fashioned tape recorder, and you know, boys, you've got to listen to this. And he put it on, and it, and it was Phil Coulter. And Phil Coulter was doing his, a version of his own song, and he 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 put he put out song sheets, and we all had to sing it and learn it for the um for the match yeah. two days later. Well, there's been there's, there's been a, a sort of focus on it in recent times, and Brian O'Driscoll did a program, and others did a program on it, and they they dipped into it, and not thinking there was any story to it. And then as they got into it, they suddenly found that there actually was a whole world of stories that are surrounding it um, and the importance importance of the song. And then Noisy Murphy, he, he I use him sometimes as an example of 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 sport in this island because uh, he used to go out onto a training pitch when he was coaching and say, right, guys, he says, spread out, but stick together. You know, so <laughs> the Ireland's a wee bit like that. You know, we, I, I, when I watched that Brian O'Driscoll documentary, I, I, I immediately thought that was a pretty brave piece of work, actually. Yeah, no, it, it was, and I think he was on a journey as much as anybody else in, in doing it. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, he contacted me about it. They wanted to go and they wanted to go and see um, the twelfth of July, yeah. and so I didn't want them going to some of the interfaces. In, in some of the areas where it, it might not have been the most comfortable places to watch it. So I contacted friends of mine in the Orange Order, and these are very, very sound people. Um, and I said, this is what he wants to do. Could you look after him? And it was only when, so they said, yep, no problem, send him down and we'll look after him. And it was only when I watched the, the program itself and I saw how they'd responded. And he said to all these young Orangemen, he says, who are all in their orange sashes, he says, who do you support if Ireland are playing against England? And they just looked at each other and sort of went, why are you asking this question? And they said, Ireland. Uh, and he couldn't understand that because he had a perception of a yeah. stereotyping. And, and I think that's one of the things you realise. that 
people are a lot more complex than the simple boxes that extremes try to put people into. And the challenge is to get people to meet and get people to know each other. And you suddenly find that you have more more than common than you have in difference. And and uh, and so these so he was surprised at that response. And uh, but it didn't surprise me because I knew I knew that you know. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's I guess it's no different from a Welsh person having a British identity and then obviously supporting Wales against England from the point of view of someone yeah. who lives in Northern Ireland. Um, and what do you think? You know, Ireland. Uh, it's it's a bit of a bit of a segue, but Ireland looking good for this year's World Cup. What do you think a, a World Cup victory uh, would do uh, oh. for, the, for the kind of thing we, we've just been discussing? <clears throat> oh, I, uh, well, the whole island will be supporting them, and it if as they t- if they progress through to the final, to get to the semi final would be would be brilliant. To get right the way through to the final uh, would be absolutely fantastic, and. Uh, they just the whole island is would be behind them, and it would just be absolutely fantastic. Uh, but there's a lot of the uh, there's a lot of stuff to go through first before we get there. I think just the same for the semi finals, and then you're down to one match, and it's about injuries, it's about players on form, and but they've been playing really, really well, and they, they do have they have two effective teams of international standard now, and. And that's a pretty good place to be in, uh, but they have certain areas that that they're maybe just a wee bit more vulnerable if there were injuries than others. So, do you think they've got a unique level of depth for an Irish team going into a World Cup? Oh yeah, yeah. I think they have this 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 squad is at a, a level of a standard and a level of ability that 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 probably we haven't seen previously, and and I think that's why they've been able to be as successful as they are. Um, because the modern game, you just do have a lot of injuries, and uh, so you need that 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 depth, that squad strength. You know, it's I tell a story about the difference in the physicality of the game compared compared to now, or, and it's one where I play in an Ulster team on a Saturday, and I used to tell it just as a, a sort of funny story, um, and we won the match on the Saturday and the selectors came into the changing rooms and said, right guys, he said, you've got another match on Tuesday night. Could you take your jerseys home and wash them? So in those amateur days, so so I said to my then girlfriend, because I wasn't going going home to see my mother, who's the only person who could wash it, uh, <laughs> is there any chance your mother could uh, wash my jersey for me? <laughs> so she was, she was a mother of three daughters and I'd never washed anything as dirty before. So she boiled it all Sunday afternoon. So the red hand of Ulster turned my white jersey into a pink jersey. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so I ran out on Tuesday night in a pink jersey. Um, but the, the serious part of the story is that, that can you see any situation now where selectors could go into a team room after a match on a Saturday and say, right, same team on Tuesday night, and all those players would say, yeah, that's fine, we'll play. Um, well, not a I, to, to be honest, Trey, I mean, I've been writing a little bit about this these last few weeks. I, I'm I'm beginning to fear that rugby's uh, rugby's falling victim to its own improvements in terms of strength and conditioning. I mean, you 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 played on the '83 Lions tour, and there were people in that Lions pack. Culcuff, I suppose, was the obvious example, who was big. Yeah, but but none of the others on weight would probably get into a fifteen, a starting fifteen. Now. I mean, very few, very yeah. few. I mean, Jeff Squire was biggish, I suppose. Bob Norsen was big, was biggish, but they weren't hundred and loads kilos, weren't they? W- were they? I mean, they, they were. Um, I, and I, I just wonder how, on the same size pitch, with the laws as they are and the power and dynamism as they are, that rugby. Is it's not unsustainable. I mean, that would be that would be overegging it, but it it would certainly have some major problems. Not least the perception of parents with with young kids who might be keen to play a sport. I think we have to find a way to defysicalize, if that's a proper word, the sport. It's too yeah, physical. I agree completely. The, <laughs> the the dynamic and the tackle. You know, we, we played hard, and we, we uh, but you know, we were taught to fall with the tackle rather than drive in. Now, you it would be called a passive tackle now, wouldn't it? It would be a passive would, yeah. tackle. So we'd be sacked, probably. Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd be. You'd be you'd, the, and 
and you know, but that increases the impact speeds, which you know, yeah. injures the joints, and then the weights involved. And we were it was replacements in our day, not substitutes. So you had to play the whole match. So if you're twenty stone, you're going to struggle to play a whole match, but you could play forty or fifty or sixty minutes. Um, and and so you, you, somehow they, I think they have to find a way that players are expected to stay on for the whole game, and that in itself will lead them to have to be slimmer and fitter. Um, and so that'll reduce size too. But somehow they have to try and defysicalize it, particularly at schools level, fifteen and above, and and at professional level. I think the clubs, to some extent, sorted out themselves. I mean, the amateur clubs. I'm not talking about the the, the sort of provinces and, and the professional clubs in England and France. But uh, but we have to defysicalize the game. It's just too physical at the minute. Um, so Stephen Ferris, Stephen Ferris, who you will know well, I'm sure, was on yeah. this on this podcast. I don't know um, uh, three months ago. A month ago, yeah. And, and we were we were we were talking about this, and and he was saying that 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 sort of constellation. Of, of 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 the the pathway schools in Irish rugby around around Dublin in particular, yeah. he said that those strength and conditioning programs in those schools were basically professional, yeah, or, or of a professional standard. And it's also the same, very much so, in in the big rugby playing schools in South Africa, which has been known to chuck out the odd big player uh, themselves. And you know, if that's the if that's the way the game is going, and people are there to win matches. Then you can you can see the motivation, but if you look on, on the bigger canvas, it can't really be good, can it? It can't be good for the game. No, it, it, and it also lead, can lead to a game of where it's more of a war of attrition than than a game of skill. And you know, we are trying to avoid avoid tackles, avoid the the, the, the physicality. And like I remember, towards the end of my career, somebody in the team suggested a great move was me on at. At blind side wing, taking the ball coming off a line out straight to the out half, and then me taking it full at full speed into the opposition back row. Okay. I then would take out the whole back row. They'd then rock the ball, having sucked in their whole back row, using me as a battering ram. And and then they would flash it out to, to Keith Cross on the other wing, and he said, We're bound to score. And I, I looked at him and I said, Why would I want to run at full pace into the opposition back row? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Sounds like you uh, you drew the short straw there, Trevor. Yeah. I did, yeah, and and I was I was physical in the way I played the yeah. game, but it just did not make sense to go, that you know the back row would just look and say a winger running straight as you know happy days. If, if you tried that in nineteen eighty three in the Test series, of course, you'd oh. have been running in, into into cowboy shore, um, well, <laughs> um, which is bad enough news in itself without anyone else joining in. Yeah, he was he was a fairly tough individual. And, uh, <laughs> I once. Uh, he, he, he once got me in one match and I sort of got him back in the next match. And I remember after the second match, uh, he came walking toward, straight towards me. And as a winger, I said, where are my wing forwards when I need them? <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't sure how he was going to react to, to, to what I'd done back to him. And he just looked at me and he just went, good on you, Trev. Stuart <laughs> <laughs> Sh- 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 Barnes t- tells a funny story of touring, touring the, uh, New Zealand in 85. Which was a fa- there were fairly a couple of fairly violent test matches, um, and 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 Stewart felt for reasons of, of um, I don't know honour I suppose that he ought to get involved in one punch up, so he just closed his eyes and took a swing and connected with yeah. someone but didn't know who, and the next thing he knew, knew was that Steve Pacari, um the the, the oh. um, borderline yeah. pacifist all black centre leapt yeah. on him with his arm across his throat and whispered in his ear. You've just hit Cowboy Shaw. Stay down here. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, dear right but yeah, bring it bring it back to that substitutions point. Um, not just not just for you, Trevor, but also uh, Chris and Brendan. Do you do you think that if you did reduce the number of substitutions merely to replacements, because it was really interesting when I was doing the research earlier for this, just to look through. You, you had big squads, but only one or two subs being used maximum. Do you think that is the way to reduce the concussion problem as well, which is particularly talked about in, well, this side of the Irish Sea? Oh, so, so I don't see any reason why not. I mean, if you're reducing the physicality phys- physicality and the impact, and I do believe that would do exactly that, it has to be a good thing. I mean, and, and this notion that front rowers can't play 18 minutes, this is complete nonsense. I mean, Warren Gatlin never got a cat because Fitzy would never come off. 
And he, you know, he, he 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 went for the full eighty. He was as good in seventy ninth minute as he was the first minute. So I don't. But you get back to the modern world and the modern game. It's health and safety, isn't it? You know, it's health and safety. You can't overload the props, um, axonal joints, all this sort of stuff. Um, and the game has got to find a way of navigating that because it's it is, it is ruining safety. the game. It's health and safety, Brent, but it's also attitudinal. I, I mean, I, I think that uh, scrapping tactical substitutions, let's be simplistic for a second, scrapping tactical substitutions completely would be would, would be transformative in depowering the game. Absolutely. The problem comes when coaches cheat. Yeah. When they invent yeah. an injury to get somebody who's having a poor game off the field, because there's not an independent doctor on God's earth who's going to stand on the touchline and say to a player, I think you're shamming, mate, get back on the field. Because if that goes wrong, his career is up yeah. the creek. So the only way you can do it is to say anyone who comes off injured has a three-week stand-in or a two-week stand-in or whatever it is. But then you probably end up in court and you're the lawyer, Trevor. Yeah, exactly. That'll probably be restraint of trade. So is the substitutions then a, a symptom of the professional game? Anyone? Yeah. I, I don't remember them being a factor before professionalism that much at all. Um, yeah, it, to it totally is. I mean, a good, good start would be at least re reduce the replacements to five. You know, I think legally, I can't see any way you can't have three front rowers. I don't want it, but that, that is the fact. Okay, let's add two more. So reduce it to five, not eight. That would be a decent start. And let's see how that goes. Yeah. Something has Nick. Something no, has to be on, done. It, it just something does have to be done. Defeat, defysicalize the game, and the, the way it's played. We won the, the triple crown nineteen eighty two in the three matches. There were a total of nineteen players used. And if you ask me during my career, the number of matches where I had where there were no replacements, and a lot of the club games there were no replacements. How many matches did I actually finish with with less than fifteen men? It it actually was a handful. Mm. Um, France won the eighty-seven Grand Slam. They only fielded fifteen players. Yeah, and and I did Sorry, a study seventy-seven Grand Slam. Yeah, that's extraordinary. And I did a study amongst ten of my 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 era about the level of injuries that they had and concussions they had. And between a hundred years of rugby, between the ten of us, uh, there were ten concussions, and and you know I had two at school. And I didn't have any during my international career whatsoever. Um, and I think Willie John McBride never had one concussion. And and so it's the game just needs to look at itself. It, 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 I think, Chris, is your point, it, it, it's, it's, it's a game that probably doesn't want everybody to be trained and, and organised uh, to 100% of their ability. I, I mean that people want to get fit and all the rest of it, but... If if it just becomes a war of attrition, it it, it becomes boring to watch. Um, and but it also is just too physical. And and then you do worry about that permeating into the way schools are are coached and and down into to the rest of the game. So it it's it's got so many pluses that come out of the playing the sport. You know the benefits of, to me as a player and, and the experiences it gave me and it continues to give me are fantastic. And there's some of those guiding principles that we shouldn't let go of because friendship was very much a very important part of rugby that Keith Crossan said, he said there should be a rule across the game that you have to buy your opposite number of drink after every game. And he buy him buying you one back. And within that half an hour, an hour you spend together, you create a bond for life. And it's funny, you go all around the place and you meet guys, you, you haven't seen them for 30 years. You know, I got a phone call for an example. I got a phone call from a, a young solicitor in, in Cork uh, was ringing me about some business and my secretary put put her through and her opening line to me was uh, my boss wants to know are you one of those rugby wingers that now looks like a prop <laughs> and, <laughs> and without asking her who she was what firm she was from or who her boss was I said you tell your boss from me that he was a hooker that always looked like a prop <laughs> there was a guy called Paul Durham played for Munster and, and you know and that's I haven't seen Paul in 30 years Um you know, uh, but yet, you know, we we had great crack when we we were we were, were younger and playing for Irish universities and and the provincial games. Um, but I think rugby needs to have a, a good hard look at itself. Yeah, you definitely had the bragging rights during those provincial games. Uh, were you part of the we team did, yeah. that won 10, 10 titles in a row? 
Yeah, we we never lost the monster, uh, which which still annoys, which is great. It's just something you bring up after a, a couple of pints. Of, um, but no, I was just very very fortunate to 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 come into a team, and we got a, a good crowd of players together, um, and we were all pretty dedicated. And as I said earlier, we we set our standards high. We had Jimmy Davidson as a coach, with Willie John McBride was there as an coach as well, and and. And others, and we came together, and um, and we trained hard and played hard, and uh, but also, you know, it was a good team of friends, and uh, and we challenged each other to to come up, you know, to to actually do the levels of training and everything required to to get us to the sort of fitness levels that we operate under, and we played some nice rugby as well, and that that was a good thing. So, so Mun- uh, Munster could beat the All Blacks, but they couldn't beat you. I try not to bring it up too often. <laughs> no, no, well, you, you've only brought it up. You've only mentioned it twice in the last minute, Trevor. So you're doing well at the moment. No, so. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say again that uh, we never lost the monster. But, uh, but no, 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 no. Did you ever lose the monster? <laughs> right, enough. This is going to go on the next half hour. Um, but uh, t- just on, just on. Uh, don't tell Michael Cairn and Don Lennon. Don't tell Michael Cairn and Don Lennon that we were talking about this because you just wouldn't want them to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's hope they don't find a way of listening. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, on the on the point about Ulster and Irish rugby as well, it's been really interesting how in the professional era, Irish rugby has gone on leaps and bounds. It's almost yeah. like the system with the clubs, the provinces, and everyone working towards the international team was built for professionalism. I mean, in terms of the number of teams and, yeah. and everything like that. Um, and Ireland have come on a long way. Ulster haven't managed to continue their dominance. What do you put both of those things down to? Uh, you've had experience in rugby administration, uh, haven't you, or, yeah. or on committees? Um, but, but yeah, um, and in your experience, having having seen that that take place over the last twenty five years, what would you um, what would you say are the key factors for Ireland's success? And although Ulster have still been pretty strong, their relative lack of success compared to where they used to be. A number of factors, certainly, that are part of it is that we were very lucky at the outset to have the leadership of the likes of Sid Miller and Tom Kiernan and the Common Sense and others in the IRFU that, that, that brought their influence to bear. Um, and like Sid, Sid Miller is probably the greatest rugby person of all time uh, in the world. And nobody will actually match what Sid contributed to the game uh, at playing level, coaching level, administration. Um but they were around at that time, and, and they were able to give uh, and steer Ireland to set set in place the foundations of what we have now. We were lucky to have the four province structure um, that that sort of t- took it out of the clubs and put it into a, a combined team that people were used to supporting. So in Wales, they've tried to, to create sort of artificial, and Scotland have tried to create sort of artificial teams, um, whereas we had that natural cohesion around the four provinces. And we set up the Rugby Academy as well um, in those times, Steve Abood and others. And one of the crucial decisions we actually took to was that we recognised that we didn't have as many international standard players as other countries. And, and so we we said our international players have to play for longer. So we managed them to to make, reduce their, their game time to make sure that they had long careers. So you look at Johnny Sexton and Brian O'Driscoll and, and Rory Best and the way that they've come come through. And then I think on the back of that provincial structure, we've had the schools, I think as somebody was saying, the Leicester schools in particular have been really good at, at producing players. Um, but we've just had the, the, the ability to, with the provinces, to keep control of the players, have the contracts to the union rather than to the clubs, um, manage those players to make sure they're well looked after medically and... Uh, and otherwise, and and that their careers can can continue for as long as possible. Um, and then the natural cohesion of of Ulster supporters, Munster supporters, Leinster supporters, you and Connacht supporters, you had a fan base there too, which automatically gets behind the teams. And so, so that's that's good. I think Leinster have got ahead of of everybody else um, at the moment, but. But that's a challenge to to the rest to sort of try and catch up a bit. And then I think women's rugby is really important for the future of the game too. And that, you know, you're, you're going to have mothers now in the future letting their children play rugby because uh, they understand the benefit. 
benefits that, that flow from it. And uh, and I think we're all becoming far more active in, in appreciating that. Um, I, I think in women's rugby, they, they allowed, I think England, New Zealand went professional and maybe went too far too soon. Mm. And it needs everybody to rise together, I think, is the way to do it because the key thing is to maintain competitiveness at the it's, it's at quite imbalanced level. isn't it uh, yeah, um, i mean it does have a problem in that sense but and this is yeah. this what i'm about to say now will probably make me really unpopular by in some sections of society but i don't mean it as any kind of demeaning comment at all but i think i think women's rugby is every bit as enjoyable if not more enjoyable than a lot of men's rugby i watch yeah primarily because um it's it's much more reminiscent of the game I fell in love with. It's much more position yeah. specific. No, I agree with you, Chris. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah. um, it, and and it, it, I, I glory in that. It's, it's absolutely terrific. You, you you don't have fifteen people who are who are so strong and so powerful and so quick that they can almost all do everything. Yeah. And and even those of us who are meant to know about this game sometimes watch a high level men's game and you know it's high level. It's really high level. And it, the skills are extraordinary. And the physicality is extraordinary. But it's hard to tell who's doing what sometimes because they're all at everything. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, everyone's grand coverage. Whereas the women's game just seems a bit more position specific. And that was one of the glories of rugby to me. And, you know, back in the day when I fell in love with it. No, I agree. It's it, it's it's that style in which it's played. And, and they should they should hold on to that. You know, yes, bring in a wee bit more of the, 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 the more modern coaching, but try and hold on. Onto that that manner and that style, and the 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 soul attitude around it, mm. uh, the ethos around it that that uh, uh, I agree that that I certainly loved and and appreciated, and I think you did too. So uh, I know we've already touched on the World Cup, uh, Trevor, but um, how much are you looking forward to to watching the Irish team play play in the competition, and in particular in such a strong group, which is obviously going to be a challenge to get out of, but. They, they've got some fantastic games lined up already in that pool stage with uh, South Africa, Scotland, and a much improved Tonga as well. Yeah. Group of death. The group of death. Yeah, it really it's is, isn't it? Death. It's tough. They, they are good at the minute, and they've shown themselves able to to maintain that that, that standard. Um, so uh, it, it's it's going to be very, very – it's going to be tough for them, uh, but they are they are actually good. And unable to sustain it, and I think, I think Johnny Sexton is 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 key, you know. And I think if because he's not just as as a player, but as a motivator on the team and as a leader on the team, I think he has a very crucial role to play. And so, I think if if uh, if we can hold on to Johnny Sexton, keep him fit and and playing, uh, enough of a six month ban. Yeah, well, you're you know, the lawyer, Trevor. I am a lawyer, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but maybe he's learned his lesson, and that'll do. That. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Um, Very diplomatic. Uh, Good. Who might uh, talk about not talking to referees? But uh, <laughs> they told you it. Um, but uh, you know, I hope that will works its way through sensibly. I'm sure he'll be available for the Yeah, weekend. I think it would be a so. mistake from World Rugby not to allow him to be available. Um, <laughs> although from one veteran... Who's yeah, because there's, 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 a, there's, there's a debate around the whole sending off the red card um, issue, you know, that in a professional sport, but maybe we find a different way of dealing with, with, with some of the sending offs that people talk about. Because um, it tends to ruin a professional game. Yeah. And yeah. if somebody gets sent off... Um, and it's so easy in these days to, to end up doing something that gets you sent off, you know. So yeah, and and it's also the case that because it's impossible, I don't blame re referees or or, or TMOs uh, for this. But consistency is extremely difficult yes. around around high tackles and players ducking into this kind of those. I mean, if if you if you kick someone's head off, um, a la you know, circa nineteen seventy two or whatever yeah. it was, if you're playing the All Blacks, then that, that that's Pretty much an open and shut case, isn't it? But so, but some of these people falling into tackles and and the head hits the shoulder or yes. whatever happens first, or there's only half a wrap or not quite a wrap and all that kind of stuff. That's very difficult to make consistent policy on that. I think. So I think if if somebody does get a red card, then let them never come back onto the pitch again. But maybe a substitute should come on after after ten yeah. minutes or fifteen minutes or something like that. Yeah. 
think that's what they're going to do, isn't it? it yeah, it, there's talk yeah. about that. So I think that the, uh, the, uh, the but the world, the world. I just wanted to touch on the, with that point the um, the bunker that they've had, the Simbin bunker thing that they've had in the. Am I, am I getting the right name for that in the under twenties rugby world championship where um, people go off? A decision is made over the course of their Simbin period as to whether they stick with the yellow card or upgrade it. Uh, to a red card. Have you been looking at that, Brendan? And how yeah, well that's that worked, worked really for, well. I mean, it's worked for Chandler Cunningham South when he was. It looked like a red, but the TMOs reviewed it and came back with the yellow card decision. Uh, I mean, the important thing is is when the incident ha- happens, the referee doesn't spend four or five minutes TMO in it. It's it's a clear. It only works when it's a clear yellow, possible red, clear yellow. Off you go, and you're in the bunker, and they're going to look at it. So the game restarts after about thirty seconds. You know, none of this. Loss of momentum, loss of continuity of the game, and then the word comes in. You know, after three or four minutes, where the TMO has looked at it at his leisure, uh, and it's just a yellow or it's a definite red, and he immediately um, informs the two captains. And I, it's worked pretty well. I mean, the only observation I've got is that if that's the TMO looking at that offence in detail, is he not missing some what's going on in the game, or do they in effect have this the not the uh, the number four ref is he helping out in the bunker um, while he's doing this TMO technology? So it might have to be fine tuned, but I thought it was pretty promising. It, it seemed to be fairly seamless and and didn't impact on the game too much. And they were getting the right decisions. I think in the end they were getting you know what was a yellow was a yellow and what was a red became a red. Apart from in the Super Rugby final, yeah, I didn't see that one, but it's it worked pretty well in the under twenties. Yeah, in fairness, that was that was an aberration. Yeah, we've, been, we've yeah. been talking about Irish uh, Irish improvement in the professional era. Um, both Chris and Brendan, how impressed have you been with Ireland's under twenties getting to the World Cup final against France this Saturday? Oh, no, number ten can play, can't he? Uh, number ten, can, uh, Brendan Gast, he's, he's a brilliant, wonderful player. boot. Um, I like the number eight, uh, Gleeson. Yeah, Brian uh, Gleeson, and and the guy who I'm not sure how much um, is written or talked about him in, in Ireland, but I haven't seen much about him. Over here, but the guy who really impressed me in the semi final was the loose head prop. I think Paddy McCarthy might be his name, who's got who just played like a flanker. I mean, absolutely. I mean, in the modern game, which we've spoken about our issues with it, but my goodness, that that bloke is an all an all purpose forward in an age of all purpose forwards. He was outstanding against South Africa. Um, um, but both at the set piece, uh, you know, there was no compromise there. His set piece work was really, really good around the field. His, his tackle count was off the scale for a loose head prop. I mean, you know, I mean, the props you played with Trevor wouldn't have made that many in a season, possibly in a career. I'll let you make that comment. I still see some of them, so <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> they, yeah, they'll they never catch, catch you. Let me know, I can assure you <laughs> that young Swiss from Cork wasn't oh, far wrong. <laughs> I mean, Ireland have been very good, Nick. I mean, outstanding. In fact, no, and no surprise because they were very good in the Six yeah, Nations, yeah. obviously. Mm. Um, they're still going to have to go some to beat this French team, oh. who are exceptional. Yeah. And they're a really strange team, France. And I, I, they've got these really big lumps and some absolutely beautiful players behind the scrum. And in fact, some of their back rowers are great hands oh, as well. Yes. Yeah, it seems to me that this, this under-20 side is, is, is it's like every great French rugby side you've ever seen. They're completely horrible up, it, up at the sharp end. You've got two speed king flankers who can play all the football. You've got a wonderful kick in 10 and you've got the good looking guy in the centre who can cut all those passes and what have you. Who everyone just would like to knock his block off really just because he's too pretty. But you can't quite get hold of him. So no. there we go. It, it's, it's it's fantastic. There, there's a real glamour about them as well. It's, a, it's the beauty and the beast with the French, isn't it? Uh, and there is a bit of beauty about the way this lot of players. The other thing I like about them as a complete pedant about the forward pass is that they don't do all this this um, short hot ball. They they line up on the angle. They're deep. Every not every, just about every pass is legal. It goes back. And do you know what? There is science to this. That there is <laughs> there yeah. is science, to this, but also it's bloody good. It's a great way of opening attack. I've never understood the absolute cult of standing up flat attacking the short pot ball. I've never understood. Understood that you you put on the angle. You've got great hands, great players with vision. Stuff will happen. Stuff will happen. If it's France, stuff will happen. If it's the Irish lads, stuff will happen. And it's great to see <laughs> we're old buggers. It's great to see some of the old verities coming back into fashion again because that's how you open defences. The, 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 the France Ireland game was 
you know, as good a match as you could get the, yes, this, course, this yeah. season. It really was. Mm-hmm. And and it's the way both teams were out to play rugby yeah. in the way we'd like to see it played. And I think that's part of the problem with the game is, is you need both teams to commit to actually trying to play rugby. And you know, rugby can be the best game in the, in the world or the worst game in the world if you decide on how you decide to play it. And and that France Ireland game was fantastic because both teams went out to play that that sort of flowing game that makes it so entertaining. Early. We've just talked about the Ireland France game in the Six Nations. Six o'clock on Friday, they're facing off in the Under Twenties World Cup. Ireland versus France is that going to be the Rugby World Cup final, twenty twenty three of the senior competition in in November? Well, that would be brilliant if it was, uh, and it would be a great match, and it would it'd be fitting for the game if it did end up at that. Because uh, the style in which both play, and is if they replicated what they replicated this earlier this season, it would be just fantastic, you know, and a really good competition. But hopefully, an Irish win. Too. Yeah, Irish win. We we covered a hell of a lot of ground there. Um, random rugby fifteen. Though this will be a bit more quick fire. Uh, nickname. My nickname. Well, I, yeah. I had at university. I had the Imac kid, and the Imac was used for hair removal and, and women's legs, and that was because I didn't start shaving <laughs> until I was about thirty. But it would have been Ringo and a, f- a few other things, but uh, nothing too bad. That's that's, <laughs> that's got to be one of the best. The Imac kid is the one that that, and I know she is, which is. <laughs> there was me expecting Trev or Ringers or something like that. Yeah, that was and... it. <laughs> Ringo, was Ringo was in there. No, Ringo was in Ringo, there. Ringo, so. yeah. uh, what was your best rugby memory? I think it has to be running out at Lansdowne Road for for my my first cap. And the guy said, "Make sure you're fourth on the way out." And uh, that's when the noise got its loudest. And I think, in in positive terms, just getting out onto that pitch, you know, was was just fantastic. And as I said, it it you know those were dark times in in Ireland. Yet here was something that was a bright light. And it was a Britishness that could also be Irish and an Irishness that could also be British and accommodate each other. People who wanted you to be out in the pitch representing them and uh, to get an opportunity to play out in that stadium and play with some of my heroes, Willie Duggan uh, and Moss Keane and Ollie Campbell and others. Uh, it was just was fantastic. So I put that one down. That's a terrific one. And and did did everyone who made their debut get the right of passage to run out at number four when the when the sound really hit? Well, I think Don Lennon and I had to buy for it, so uh, I maybe let him go at three. I kept him happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was your most embarrassing or your worst rugby memory? Uh, my my worst rugby memory. Um, my worst rugby memory is probably letting Chris Ody score three tries at at, at Twickenham. Um, <laughs> When I got back to the hotel room, the rest of the guys went to the bar and they said, Trevor, we'll see you later. <laughs> and and I rang, so I thought I'll ring my mother because no matter how badly you play, uh, your mother thinks you were good. And so I rang home and instead I got my young brother, who's nine years younger than me, Jonathan. And his words of comfort were, what the hell did you go and do that for? He says, I can't go out tonight because of you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, did you listen to any music before games or not really? No, I didn't. No, um, it's quite a modern you know, phenomenon. We, that one, isn't we it? Didn't, we didn't have anything like that. You know, we, we had to, we had to sing the music. So, the uh, Moss Keane demanding that you sing the sash, you know, which you know, and you just you didn't say no to Moss Keane. You, you, but that, that, that was only if you won. It was it, it was it was those things in the amateur area, you know. If you won a game, you were taken across the road in Dublin to Donahue's pub, and you were absolutely knackered mentally and physically. And you went in there, and if you won the game, there was sort of a rule that I'm not sure how much they applied it, but if you won the game, you got free drink, and if you lost the game, you had to buy your own. And <laughs> but there was two hundred people in a bar fit for fifty, and. At first, you thought, do I really want to be here? And within half an hour, you, you, you actually didn't want to leave, but you had to to go back to the dinner. Um, but it was great. The whole team were in there and, and mixing with the supporters. Uh, it was, again, back to that ethos of the game. It was, to me, it was something very important, you know. And what was your favourite post-match meal to have after a game? Best post-match meal was the venue, probably, which was in France. Um, the French just did the meal. You know, it was a very special occasion, the most magnificent uh magnificent venue and you know superb meal as you as you might imagine um 
And it was actually nice being there one time when Jack Kyle was at was at the French game. And this is like 50 years after Jack Kyle had played. They mentioned that he was in the room at the meal and he got a standing ovation from the French who remembered him as a player having played so well all those years before. And, you know, and that's how much... The French always hold on to the ethos of the game very much that, you know, certainly during our time and, and even later times, that was always a very important aspect to them. Yeah. Who was the best player that you played alongside? It was actually Serge Blanco. Uh, not only did I play against him, but I, I actually managed to play a match with him. Uh, we had a, a Five Nations match against uh, sort of Northern, Northern Hemisphere against the Southern Hemisphere uh, in in 1986 as the centenary celebrations of the International Rugby Board. And so I got to play with him and and, and Sela, which was quite special. Serge Blanco, at his best, was just... He, it was poetry in motion. Unfortunately, it was leaving me with my face in the dirt, but that was still, you just reflected, that was really good. I must see how I could try and match that, which you couldn't do. Great to have the, the same player for both answers. Played with, best play yeah. played with and best play played against. Um, who's your favourite player at the moment? I think, you know, I, I must say, I think Johnny Sexton has, has done a tremendous job. I think just the leadership he's shown and the, the stickability. Um, I think I, I have to give credit to him that he's been very much to the forefront of bringing this Irish team and squad together. And and I think that uh, I think tremendous credit to him. And and I think that I hope he has a really really good World Cup. And uh, because it's probably going to be his last series of games. And so I hope it really is, gives him an opportunity to shine, even at the age that he's at. And and I think Ireland need not only his playing, as I mentioned earlier, but also his leadership on the on the pitch. Um, so, who was your rugby idol when you were growing up? Well, there's likes of Ollie Campbell, who I ended up playing with as well. Who um, there was Mike Gibson as well, and then there's the great Willie John McBride. Um, who I was fortunate at the very end of his career, I managed to play a match uh, Queen's University against Ballymena, which was his club. And I was standing on the pitch at 18, 19 years of age and, and he came running out and I just thought, here I'm playing with one of my my all-time heroes because he had the 74 Lions and 71 Lions and the great career that he had. Mm. And here I am on the pitch with one of my great all-time heroes. And I remember halfway through the game thinking, why is my rugby hero trying to pull my head off my shoulders? <laughs> Never meet your heroes, you he know what they say. He, he, he didn't get he didn't get all those caps for being a, a pushover in any shape or form. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but a, a great ambassador for the game, and and Sid Miller. Um, uh, uh, I think what Sid has achieved through rugby, the benefit that he has brought to rugby, he, he is the greatest rugby person ever, and I'm not sure we fully appreciate that, that mm. to the extent we should. Uh, what he did for the game. And he brought just so much common sense to to all situations, you know, with a good sense of humour as well. So, yeah, that's great. It's it's really interesting, actually, the the discussion that we've had about you know administrators being just as important as the system that's that's yeah, in place yeah. originally. Um, what's the best stadium that you played at? I'm I'm expecting it to be Lansdowne Road, but you never well, know. <laughs> It would be it would be easy to say Lansdowne Road and Lansdowne Road was fantastic and Cardiff was fantastic, but for sheer atmosphere, the Parc de Prince, uh, particularly when the French were in full flow, which was something we were trying to do. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get the sound sense the crowd when I usually played against them, but but uh, so we usually saw them in full flow and <laughs> it was just you had the Basque bands playing in the crowd all over the place and the the colour and the noise. Uh, it just was the most amazing atmosphere. But Lansdowne Road in those days they sang Molly Malone and all the rest of it, and it was it was great. Um, but in, in many ways, all the all the venues were quite iconic in their in their own in their own different ways because you had the mass you know standing area at Murrayfield as well. Oh, fantastic, yeah. And then the Welsh singing and and then Twickenham just to to, to be at, at Twickenham and and. The home of English rugby it was just a very special place too. So, so they all had their their own particular aspects to them. Um, but the Parc des Princes, just the the, the sheer cauldron of noise was just amazing. And 
you know, the color that they brought to the whole thing was just great. It generated its own intensity, didn't it? The park there was the, it yeah. was remarkable. Yeah, yeah. It just the noise just came down onto yeah. the pitch, and yeah. that that was the thing about it. That I think other stadium it goes out of the ground. In Park de France, it, the design of the ground it just came down onto the pitch. And there's only about 40, and, 45, 000, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it, no, wasn't, it wasn't wasn't the biggest yeah. ground. Yeah, no, it wasn't big at all. It wasn't big at all. But it was it was also the fact that you had whole bands sitting in the crowd just playing away. <laughs> And then this French cockerel would, would wander past you in the middle of the pitch. Yeah. And score a try, probably, Trev. <laughs> I thought about giving it a kick and then I, I stopped myself, which is probably just as well. <laughs> <laughs> Against England's defence these days, that cockerel would have a hell of a chance of scoring oh, a try. Oh, hat trick. Sure. Hat trick written all over it. Well, we're coming on to the questions that are more favoured towards the professional era. But did you used to do gym exercises and stuff during that time? And what was your favourite if you did? We, tra- we trained, we actually trained, you know, you trained seven days a week, sometimes twice a day. So you did actually put a lot of effort in. You had the likes of Mike Gibson um, and, you know, and he set a standard really. He was towards the end of his career whenever I was starting, but you used to bump into him up at the Mary Peters running track that we had in Belfast and the, the sprint training that they were doing. And Jimmy Davidson brought in a sort of professionalism into the way we trained and the weights programs and, and, the different aspects that you would bring to your training. And I always looked on training as a way of finding as many different ways of doing the same thing to keep it interesting. So likes of a good game, series of squash games were five meter sprints. Swimming was upper body. And then we would go to the Mary Peters track and the sprint sessions we had with the likes of Nigel Carr in those days. And there was nobody, there's nobody today fitter than Nigel Carr was then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I just used to edge him in the sprints, which really still annoys him. And uh, so even me mentioning that will annoy him. But uh, but he was he was quick, but just not quite quick enough for Keith Crossing and myself. <laughs> um, but uh, but there was nobody fitter than Nigel. The, the difference is that Nigel could do a hundred of them. We had to stop after about twenty or thirty. <laughs> and uh, but I must say, I, I enjoyed doing proper sprint sessions. So, yeah, it says occupation if rugby doesn't, didn't exist. I think we might instead do sport. What sport would you have played if rugby didn't exist? Hmm. Well, I, I think, again, at that time it was you played it, You played every sport that you, you could play and, and enjoy. Um, my father was a, a, a hockey player, presented at Ulster Schools and the police at, at hockey. His big claim to fame was when the Sinbin was introduced, he was the first person in Irish hockey to be in it. But to be honest, I, I think I found my niche in rugby – whether I would have been as good at any other sport, I'm I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it it suited my my temperament, but you know, obviously, we all wanted to be soccer players. Um, or Pat Jennings in my case, the goalkeeper. Um, but I I was lucky just to find a sport that that I I, I enjoy all sports. Um, but I managed to find one that I I was given a great opportunity and great privilege to 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 do well in. And it really was, you know, just the experiences I had over the years, just absolutely fantastic and continue to have them. And and it's, uh, I owe an awful lot to the sport. Fortunate enough to get that opportunity, you know. Would you say the best best thing in in, in the game, because um, that's, that's the last question, incidentally, do you think the best thing in the game was being able to make friendships and meet people from all over the world and travel all over the world as well? Yeah, no, it, it's 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 taking something seriously and, and committing to it and and working hard at it. And you know, you just didn't get out onto the pitch. You, there was an awful lot of work, but there's awful enough that you put in. As I said, you train sometimes twice a day, seven days a week, in different ways. But there's an awful lot of people who are also helping you to 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 become a better player. You know, my father was somebody I always looked for advice from. Um, and the likes of this, there's a scenario selector called Dion Glass who played rugby for Ireland. And, and Dean, I would always turn to him to get advice from him. And in those days, it was an amateur game. And there was amateur people who were actually managing the game as well. But the input they had in the, the, the sort of, they paid back into the game what they got out of it too. And there's there's an element of that, and I think, in sport that you, you owe it to future generations to give something back to them as well. As because you benefited from people doing that for you in those times, 
and the ethos of friendship that rugby brought to sport uh, was quite special. And, and so you created those friendships right across the island of Ireland. And as I said, that, that even during those terrible times, I never had a bad experience across the island. And you contrast that with the other stuff that was going on. And across these islands as well, and the British Irish Lions Tour was such a privilege to be involved in, in going to New Zealand. And as I say, loveliest people, um, but not to play rugby against. So as long as you weren't on the rugby pitch with them, but off the pitch, they were the most hospitable and wanted to make sure you had their best time ever. And in those amateur areas, that was your reward really, was your, your those experiences and that you got from traveling around the world. Once the game intensified with the World Cup and became more professional, it, that's when it had to change because your time was being demanded and only in a way that money had to compensate for that because the sort of the more enjoyable side was diminishing and the more serious side was increasing. And so I, I played in a lovely time. I scored two tries against Scotland in 1985 in a match. And on the Monday morning, I had my first appearance in court as a lawyer, um, and which was I more nervous about. And it was appearing in front of the uh, it was appearing in front of the judge, Johnny Adams, who was also an Alagadu committee man at Balamina. And he welcomed me into the court, which made me even more nervous. And and he said, I see Mr. Ringland's taking up a right wing in the position of the court. <laughs> and, that, and, and all the police officers knew me. And as I said, I stood up with my hands shaking and uh, ended up... He still gave my client a hundred pound fine. So, there's no favoritism. <laughs> there's no favoritism, but but uh, but that that's the beauty of having the experience of working, playing hard, but also you worked your day job, and it was a lovely mix of things. And I probably wouldn't have it any other other way. Um, with the rugby, one of the other questions is rugby law. You would change. Um, I assume it would be something to do with substitutions. And and weight limits, as we discussed earlier. Yeah, uh, I think it, it's 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 we have to find a way of defysicalizing the game. Um, I'm involved in the charitable trust for injured rugby players, and we do you know we have concerns about the health and safety of players, and I think there has to be a way of playing that sort of style that France play. That has to become the norm. That there may be more tries scored, there's more risks taken. The game becomes a wee bit more open. The the size of the players is somehow reduced. And so we have to find a way of trying to do that. And that to me is about the future of the game and the future welfare of the players. As an entertaining game, I think it, they should do something about about the sending offs that that it it that the, the player sent off doesn't come back onto the pitch, but maybe after ten or fifteen minutes another player's allowed on because it destroys a game if a player is sent off. Um but I think overall we have to maintain a focus on on uh, on encouraging more open style of the game being played and and reducing the the impacts that that are on the game through the size of the players and the way the game's being played. Um, I would nearly have the offensive driving tackle. I would nearly ban that in itself because that increases the speed. Uh, you can stop a player or you fall with them, but you can't drive them back. That might sound a bit strange, but uh, but something like that. We were going to finish with a discussion about the rugby championship. We've run out of time for that. Um, but it actually links nicely what we've just been discussing to Stuart Hogg, uh, who retired Im- with immediate effect on Monday. To all of you for this, based on what we've just been discussing, is him retiring at 31 a symptom of the game being too physical in the last decade where he's been playing? I'm not sure about that. I mean... He's had injuries, Stuart, but I'm not sure he's had mm. loads of massive high-impact injuries. You know, he's had knees and hamstrings and, and shoulders. He Only he can know, you know, how bad his body is. You could see it happening, couldn't you, in the last year. I, I know He has that lovely sort of half hitch kick, doesn't he, when he sort of does a, a stutter step and hits the burners. And in the past, he would just go round whichever defender that was. Well, that hasn't been happening for a year or so now. You know, so he's lost that gas. Um, but... I mean, what a player. We were talking about Blank and all that. OK, you can't quite go that high, but he was a smashing player. Twice Six Nations Player of the Year, 25 tries. He probably created 50 tries in international. Uh, he used to combine so brilliantly um, with a number of those scholars. Tim Visa, I don't know if you remember Tim Visa on the wing. He used yeah. to have these wonderful little tip passes. 
he always found Tim Visa. It was a joy to watch um, and good luck on him. I'm a little bit surprised he's gone now, but these summer camps are brutal. If you're if you're carrying injuries, I suspect you get found out and there's been stuff going on down in the Welsh camps. Uh, and he might not be the last big name who doesn't quite make it through to the World Cup, I suspect, because they are really being found out at these camps. And it just concentrates the mind. Can can my body do this anymore? And and he's decided not. But my God, he, he gave us some great memories. I love watching Stuart Hogg. Yeah. He was I mean, an exciting player to watch, I agree. He, he, yeah, he was. I mean, I think he made a lot of mistakes, Hogg. Um, and, uh, and I think Gregor... Knowing Gregor reasonably well as I do, uh, and Gregor was a, a cracky, he was a, a maverick himself uh, for sure. So, so maybe that um, maybe that explains it. But I, I think I think in Hogg's case, and I'm sure I'm sure all his reasons for retiring are genuine. But maybe just subconsciously, he, he sort of felt the shadow of Blair Kinghorn over his shoulder, and 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 Kinghorn's on an upward curve, and Stewart's on a downward curve. And maybe you don't want those two things to be happening at something as high profile as a World Cup. Um, I think I think Stuart was an exceptional player. Would I put him? Uh, would I would I put him better than than Andy Irving or Gavin Hastings? I'm not sure I would. He was probably more exciting than Gav. Um, but he's uh, but whether whether he's the absolute top of the tree in Scottish fullbacks, he's he's on the podium. I think probably, but. Maybe um, maybe a notch down from Hastings and Irvin in the final analysis, I would say. Trevor, just to finish off, um, how happy have you been to see Scotland's re- revival, very similar to Irish initially, Ireland initially in that premier, um, that professional era in the last 10 years? And uh, how happy are you that Stuart Hogg's retired before the pool match that he's going to play against your boys? <laughs> no, I, well, I, first of all, in relation to Scotland, I think it's great to see them them back and competitive because the more competitive the Six Nations is, the better for the game. Stuart Hogg gave us some tremendous moments. He, I just loved seeing him get a bit of space and hit the afterburners. And he has stopped, obviously, for, for, for his own reasons. And I think the guys alluded to maybe the reasons for that, that that just the gaps just weren't opening up for him in the way they did in the past. Um, and he's, 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 he's taken, as a result of that, he takes a lot more punishment than maybe he did in the past um, but uh, but he'd be sadly missed, he's a great player and we all enjoyed watching him um, but Nick if I could just maybe on a, on a serious point and it was alluded to earlier, you know the, the past week has been a tough week for the Irish rugby family um, mm-hmm. and our thoughts are with um, the Oliver family, the O'Donnell family and the Wall family at this time, you know it's our thoughts have to go with them too, but uh, um, yeah, 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 well said. Yeah, Trevor, thank you so much. You've been extremely generous with your time, um, and yeah, it's been a fantastic episode. Very, very insightful. Very interesting. Uh, Brendan and Chris, you'll be relieved to know that Ollie will be hosting this again next week. Uh, so my time, <laughs> my short stint is done. <laughs> well played, um, Nick. well played. But Trevor, once again, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Great, good. Thanks, and cheers, Trevor. And let's okay. hope we have a hell of a match on Friday. We will, I think. Yeah. No. Let's hope so. Yeah. Thanks All so right. much, Trevor. Real pleasure. The rugby paper is available to buy every Sunday, and to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe through our print, digital, and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions get all our content for as little as 14p per day.